Ladies and gentlemen. Watch it. Welcome back to another episode of the Deep Six Wrestling Podcast. It is now Monday, April 26th here on the East Coast of the United States. Um, And we just got, well, we finished up watching Rebellion Impact's latest pay-per-view about an hour ago. And, uh, yeah. Um, So, I'm Ryan. And I am still... The reigning D6 champion coming out of this show. Only me, Ryan, Angelo, and Joey predicted it. But I did officially win our predictions challenge. Joey came in last. Uh, and I'm Pat. Yeah. Um, me and Angelo were a little confident in ourselves. We were like, oh, well, it's an impact show. This is our home turf. Hopefully we'd uh, do well. And I'd say we did. I, I did well. Um, just Pat did one better. Um, so, yeah. Um, I thought this was a huge step above Hardcore Justice in terms of quality of the matches. No, but, Jesus, by a, by a goddamn long shot. Uh, but production-wise, um, Impact feels like they're going backwards. <laughs> um, which I don't understand why. Um, but we'll get into that when those issues come up. Um... So yeah, uh, before we get into this, remember to follow us on all our social media, which will be in the link in the description. And if you want to subscribe to us on a different platform than what you are already listening to, something that you might uh, prefer, uh, again, links are always in the description. Um, So yeah. Uh, Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, you can follow us at Deep Six Wrestling, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which we also now post the the podcast episodes on as well. Yeah, always. Um, so yeah, um, this was probably one of my favorite shows of the year so far. Um, this was a really fun show, um, and I think it had a little bit for everyone. Uh, and they started off extremely hot with. Uh, a really good matchup, um, and me and Angelo nor- have normally said this about like the regular weekly shows that a- or that Impact normally tries to it seems put their two best matches one at the beginning, one at the end, uh, and I felt they did that for this show as well, uh, and they start off with the X Division Championship three way uh, between TJP, Josh Alexander, and the champion Ace Austin. Um, so going into this show, I think we all knew who, or we all hoped who we didn't, uh, think was going to win, uh, and that being TJ Page, just because he's been in the title picture for basically the entire time we've been watching, uh, Impact, me and Angelo, uh, and we just don't care about TJ P. Um, but Ace Austin finally got in his title shot, finally got in his title win, um, after winning uh, the Super X Cup, um, and finally got that that big W, that another X Division title under his belt, uh, at only I believe 24, 25 years old, so still super young, um, and Josh Alexander being uh, formerly of the North, the most dominant tag team uh, in Impact history, uh, with their one over one year reign uh it's just a domination that they had and the interesting idea of him being a singles competitor who's actually doing a lot of mic work um compared to what he was doing with the north uh has was definitely a idea that i think a lot of people have gotten around i think people enjoy josh alexander um he's got a unique look uh with the headgear um and uh, yeah, he's definitely a unique looking guy for the X division, which I feel like most people still just 
like when you think X Division, think high work rate, but high flying and super flippy stuff. Uh, that's not what Josh Alexander is about. He and he helped keep this for the most part on the ground, but he does go in the air when he needs to. Uh, and I thought this was a good uh, little showing for all three men involved. Pat, how about you? Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, we obviously, well, not obviously, but we watched this actually last. We missed this um, live, so we went back and watched this after the main event finished. Um, but I thought this was a really solid match, and it would have served as a solid opener for the show. Um, for us, that wasn't the case, but I thought Josh Alexander looked really, really good, which I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy for since I'm a big Josh Alexander mark. Uh, as stated any time I've appeared on the uh, the Impact Reviews. Love the guy. Uh, very happy that he won the X Division Championship. I know, you know, Ryan and Angelo Diaz wanted Ace Austin, um, mainly just because he hasn't really got to do much, but um, I'm not going to complain about the walking weapon walking away with the win. Yeah, I, I don't think myself or Angelo are going to complain about Ace Austin, or Ace Austin losing. Um as much as we really enjoy him, um, Josh Alexander definitely has deserved it um, for what he's been putting th- going through. Uh, he's been putting on really good matches anytime he's in the ring, uh, so he definitely feels like he should be rewarded for it, and I guess reward him for staying around when Ethan Page didn't. Um, the bad thing about the, the, the big detractor from this match um, is... They pinned Ace Austin, um, which I don't think that helps Ace Austin at all. Um, don't know why TJP is still in because this just feels like okay. Well, TJP is now going to be the in the title picture again, and he doesn't need to be. Like he, I don't understand what the deal is with protecting TJP. It feels like and keeping him in the X division. Um, I understand that he's definitely not a heavyweight, and you don't, you're not going to put him in your world title picture um, when you only have two singles belts, uh, one being the X division, one being the uh, heavyweight title. You're not going to put TJP in that position, especially since TJP isn't signed. He's a freelancer, um, but I don't know. It feels like he's just taking up a spot that could be used for literally anybody else you could put Rohit you could put Shira you could put um bring Willie Mac back into the fold you have Chris Bay who's out of nowhere off TV no mention of why he hasn't been on he might be injured I don't know um you have Brian Myers in there it literally there's so many different people you could put in there um but like just having TJP thrown in here all the time just isn't for me uh, yeah, as somebody who doesn't really watch Impact that often, uh, my opinion isn't really as, uh, I guess, valid. But TJP, I think TJP is a very talented wrestler, character-wise. He's kind of always been the same. And it, anytime I feel, I feel like anytime I watch Impact, the guy's on there doing something um, and just being TJP. So I, I would like some more variety in the X Division, I think. So hopefully with Josh Alexander being crown champ, that uh, that comes to fruition. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming Ace Austin cashes in his rematch. Um, I mean, technically, uh, I've said this before, that technically he never cashed in his Super X Cup number one contendership. He won a number one contendership match and then got into the X Division title pick and won it. Um, like So technically, I guess you could say, hey, I'm, I'm in the Super X Cup, I, I'm finally cashing this in, because Scott, for some reason, has kept on denying him a chance to cash it in. Every time he says, I'm cashing in, he's like, yeah, actually, you're going to go up against TJP or Josh Alexander or somebody to work your way towards it. Um, so hopefully the A.E. Salson doesn't like fall down the pecking order here too much. Um, but yeah. After this, we had our eight-man tag match. And before the eight-man tag match started, um, Matt Stryker and D'Lo Brown are shown. And Matt Stryker tells everybody about uh, how Eric Young is injured. He has been pulled from the match. Uh, but Eric Young has decided on somebody else who is, uh, to quote him, violent by design. 
uh, and we get a promo for him, and the entire time, uh, Rhino, Joe Doring, and Diener are flanked around him and are just looking up towards something, which made everybody think, okay, well, it's a big guy. And Eric Young, when he was addressing this person, was also looking up. Um, and this meshed well with the report that apparently uh, the former big Cass uh, from WWE was spotted uh, at the Impact Zone um, in Nashville. Uh, so all signs pointed towards Kaz XL making his de- Impact debut. Um, and technically, yes, but technically no. At the same time, he didn't. And I'll exp- explain why. Uh, but we got... Uh, so it's Storm, uh, James Storm, Chris Sabin, Eddie Edwards, and... Uh, Willie Mack versus Violent by Design, Diener, Rhino, Joe Doring, and the debuting W. Morrissey, uh, who is, of course, Big Cass. He has a whole new name. Uh, he got his own Titantron, his own m- music compared to Violent by Design, and uh, commentary says that he ha- that Eric Young has hired this man uh, for the match. Uh, and that he is not an official member of Violent by Design. Um, he looks in great shape, uh, first off, compared to, like, a few years ago, once he was on the Indies, when he clearly it was in some bad places, very heavy-looking. Um, uh, he is slimmed down. He's got a lot of muscle back. Uh, and he looks great. Um, in the match... Uh, he didn't really mesh extremely well. With, like you could tell that he um, w- was a different person from Violent by Design. He d- it doesn't have wrestling tights. He's just in black pants, um, unlike the other guys who are in their normal gear. Um, and I think this wrestling name is atrocious. W Morrissey is trash. Uh, call him William Morrissey. His full name. Call him Will Morrissey. Call him Morrissey. W. Morrissey is a trash name. Um, Kaz yeah, XL I isn't I good. Don't think many, I don't think many people would disagree that W. Morrissey sounds bad. Um, yeah. I, it's not the worst name I've ever heard. Yeah, it's, um, not, Kaz, it's not Kaz XL bad. But, yeah, but I, I agree. He should just go by Will Morrissey or William Morrissey. Yeah. Um, overall, I... Th- this was an interesting match that was kind of just meant to show showcase a lot of the talent that wasn't going to be on the card that normally is, like Sabin, Storm, Willie Mack, and Eddie Edwards, um, and Violent by Design. I think it definitely was interesting seeing Eric Young uh, sit sitting at the top of the entrance ramp the entire night, or the entire match. Um, and, yeah, um... The person who we all thought was going to eat the pin ate the pin, that being Willie Mac. That's oh, what yeah, Willie Mac does. Um, I will continue to say that the the fall of Willie Mac in the past year has been devastating. Um, he was one of the few people I, I knew existed uh, in Impact when I started watching it. Uh, he was one of the few people that I had known some of his work and enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, from lo- he lost uh, the X Division title when we first started watching, and has just basically been getting pinned ever since. Um, after the match, Morrissey uh, ends up beating down uh, Willie Mack some more, uh, and walks. Uh, he stands tall in the ring while Violent by Design stands on the entrance ramp behind him, um, which I thought was a good look. Um, and yeah, uh, totally forgot about his finishing move being uh, the East, East River Crossing. Um, I, for some reason, I thought it was the Staten Island Slam just because wrestling, er, because everything Enzo, Cass, and Carmelo was related to something New York which, I, I mean, the East River Crossing is. Uh, then we also thought it was a big boot, so thankfully that wasn't the finish. Um, but he looked, he looked good. I wouldn't say he looked great. I wouldn't say he looked bad. He, he was good. 
Uh, I definitely think his look has improved since his time in WWE. Agreed. Um, he just, like, he, he looks healthier, he looks bigger, he looks more impressive. Yeah. Um, so I definitely think he has that going for him, at the very least. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he sticks around in WWE, or not WWE, Impact, or, or what. Yeah, um, we also talked about if he is not going to join Violent by Design full-time, if he is just going to be like this hired gun, um, where does he go from here? Um, he's definitely not going to the X Division, that's for sure. Um, you don't say. But, like, do you just have him, like, Kind of like a Hernandez type who just like bounces around from heel to heel fact heel group to heel group. Um, does he join up with uh, Sammy Callahan, who always feels like he needs a second person in his his stories? Um, what do you do from here with him, or is this just a one off thing? Um, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it should be interesting. And of course, we did also say that if. He is here for the long run. Do we see Enzo show up uh, as E. Morrissey? And we fancy booked them as uh, twins uh, following the storyline of uh, twins starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Danny DeVito. Dude, I hope. I'd be fine with it. It works. Uh, Because Cass, from my remembrance of him as a singles superstar in wwe for the brief few months that it happened he was awful on the mic um so he's definitely gonna need somebody partnered up with him uh which again if you're gonna put him in violent by design for a few months while eric young's out okay eric young can be his mouthpiece if he's gonna stay on tv with the injury um if he goes with sammy or something sammy can be his mouthpiece um, or you bring in Enzo. So, interesting to see what happens. Uh, next up was Matt Cardona versus Brian Myers. Um, and this was one of the matches that I thought could kind of be a dark horse on what could be a, a match, a match of the night contender. Um, just because they're, Brian Myers is fantastic in ring. Uh, and Matt Cardona has worked with and known Brian Myers for, about 20 years, they said, they've been uh, doing wrestling together. Uh, came up through the same school. Uh, we're tag team for so many years. Um, so, looking forward to this. Um, been a pretty good feud. Uh, we didn't think that this was going to be the last part of this feud. Um, who knows anymore? Um, so this was a good match. They, they were definitely showcasing that they knew each other's style really well, uh, countering each other's big moves. The roster cut by Brian Myers was, uh, countered a few times. Brian Myers dodged and ducked a few different, uh, rough riders or, uh, whatever the, uh, the, the, um, the radio silence, radio silence. Yes. Um, and oh boy. Did he dodge one of them? Uh, to end the match here, this this wasn't an extremely long match, and I don't think it was supposed to be in the long run, but uh, it, I think it definitely did get cut short a bit. Uh, so Cardona goes for a ra- another radio silence, and Myers ducks it, and Cardona's leg and, ank- and knee just buckle and twist the opposite way. Uh, and he's like, it looks like one of those bad basketball injuries um, where they just land awkwardly. Uh, and he's rolling around. Myers comes over to kind of check on him, but kind of just be a dick um, and try to continue the match. Uh, he starts whispering to uh, the ref. The ref throws up the X in front of the camera, uh, then throws it up again, kind of away from the camera, and calls for more refs to come out to try to help. Uh, and Brian Myers just kind of sits in the corner for a bit, uh, and as they're checking on Cardona, uh, they show it again, kind of in a little bit more slow-mo, and you can just see the knee and leg just buckle in a really awkward way. Um, and then Brian Myers comes over, grabs the ref, uh, and talks to Matt Cardona for a second, Picks Matt Cardona up, hits him with a uh, uh, clothesline, 
and then sets them up for the roster cut, hits the roster cut, one, two, three, win. Um, and, yeah, I think this is a serious injury that he suffered. I don't think this is a, hey, we're going to do a work here. I think Cardona and Myers are professionals, and they just decide, okay, we're really on the fly here. Let's try to, can you finish this match real quick? Um, yes, okay, here we go. Um, and did that on the fly. Um, probably feels like hell. Um, apparently, apparently, uh, Matt Cardona tweeted that his kneecap was out of place, uh, but they re, uh, put it into its right position. Um, but definitely seems like there's probably some more damage done. Uh, so hopefully wishing the best to Matt Cardona. Uh, yeah, I didn't even really peep that it was like how bad it was on the initial spot. But, uh, once we got the, the instant replay on his knee, uh, looked brutal. Uh, very simple, not as not nearly as bad as the the UFC injury last night. Um, yeah, but or two nights ago now. But uh, you know, you hate to see it. So hopefully, uh, Cardona's gonna be okay. I mean, from his tweet, he seems like he's feeling good. So I uh, just hope it's nothing too serious. But yeah, I thought the match was pretty good up until that point. Uh, they have good chemistry. It's cool to see these guys not being treated like jobbers. <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah. Um... If you like want to get another uh, like view on this, uh, I would suggest not looking at Bleacher Report because they think that this is all a work. Um, which, no, like that you you can't work your leg to bend that way. Um, yeah. Uh, after this uh, was the Knockouts Tag Team Championship match between the champions Fire and Flavor. Uh, Tasha Steeles and Kiara Hogan versus Jordan Grace and the de debuting Rachel Ellering. Um, I thought this was probably the best women's tag team championship match that they've had since uh, they've brought the tag titles back. Um, this was very fluid. There were a few botches near the end of this match, but they kind of worked themselves out of it. Um, and... Yeah, I thought this was a really solid match overall. Um, Rachel and Jordan look like they have really good chemistry together. Um, they knew exactly w what kind of tag team moves to do. Um, and they're, they're definitely a team to mess to, that are going to be taken seriously um, for a, quite some time. Um, Tasha and Kara have been great at what they've been doing um but just i don't know they just because of the lack of teams they just haven't really clicked um as champs just because they just kept on facing havoc and nevaeh and then this um and this was again this was definitely their best match as tag champs um so yeah um i don't have much else to say um, commentary claimed that um, they thought Rachel had met, uh, had injured herself near the end of the match. I didn't spot that. I just think she was selling, but they kept on saying that hopefully Rachel is okay. Uh, and other people on Twitter were talking about how she might have tweaked her, her bad leg. Um, but I, I didn't notice anything. Hopefully, again, she's not injured because she literally is just coming back from major leg injury from a few years ago uh so yeah um pat how did you compare this to other women's tag matches i mean uh, it blew the one at mania out of the water that's for certain um yes. i don't really have a strong opinion either way uh i'm just happy to see a new team in the knockouts tag division something that it feels like they desperately needed to have just some new life in there um, yeah, and I thought Rachel Ellering looked pretty good. I haven't seen her in a while, so, uh, you know, good to see her back. Hopefully she can, uh, stay healthy. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in her, in her and Jordan as a team. I'm also interested to see if, a, uh, Impact's gonna make some more tag teams or if they're gonna sign some people, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, after this was last man standing match between Trey Miguel and Sammy Callahan and 
it's probably going to be a divisive match for a lot of people because some people, or there's a lot of people that dislike everything Sammy Callahan touches, um, and there's some people that really like Sammy Callahan. I'm in the Sammy Callahan, a good wrestler, uh, and a good character, um, and I'm in that boat. I know Pat and Angelo do not like or do not care for Sammy Callahan. Uh, I thought this yeah. was a, I thought this was a really fun match for the most part. Um, sucks that uh, two of their table spots uh, or the, their two big table spots. I feel like both kind of got fucked up by tables. Uh, with um, their first one, the table legs breaking uh, when Sammy went for a package pile driver into the table, um, and then to end the match, um, uh, Trey Miguel went for. Uh, like run, he ran on the apron and like a f- flying cutter into the table, uh, and it looked like S- Sammy kind of like just his head hit the table, um, and Trey looked like he almost overshot the table. Um, so tables not their friends in this match, um, but I thought these guys have fantastic chemistry, and it shows that they've worked together for years. Um, whether it was on the Indies in CZW, um, with the Rascals versus, uh, Ohio ver- versus everything, um, the Rascals versus OVE again throughout the last few years of, uh, Impact, uh, and Sammy and Trey's recent storylines together. Uh, I think this was a really strong match for both guys. Um, Trey, I think needs more character because I really just don't care about Trey right now. Um, So him picking up this win, it'll be interesting to see where he goes. Does he go and try to strive towards the world title? Or does he go and be like, okay, I want to show that I'm a workhorse. I I can be like the face of the the division. Um, Even though I'm kind of bordering on the lines of heel face uh, and go for the... X division title kind of go after go him versus Josh Alexander I think could be a good feud um, and again would take away TJP hopefully um, there were some inventive spots here in this last man standing match most notably um, Sammy driving uh, uh, Trey into the um, the legs of the uh, table that they had set up upside down. Um, that that just looked awful to take. Um, and then Sammy also laid out uh, Trey on the ground and then put the steel steps on top of him uh, to prevent him from getting up. Uh, but Trey just crawled underneath the ring to get out, which I thought was really inventive. I've never seen somebody try to just put, put the steps over top of somebody to keep them down. Uh, so that, I thought that was a cool spot. Anything you want to say about yeah, I thought it was a pretty solid last man standing match. Um, I still think Roman versus Owens from, what was it, the Royal Rumble where they had that? Yeah. Um, I think that overall was better. That had, like, the weird finish with uh, the handcuffs awful, on Roman. Awful, awful finish. Yeah, but I think that overall that was the better match. Um, this one, there were some spots where the ref clearly should have been, mainly early on in the match, where the ref yes. should have been counting and he just wasn't, and, like, I mean, that's fine, because we know the match isn't going to end, but it kind of just breaks the whole, like, idea that this is a, a match. Um, but I thought both guys went pretty uh, pretty hard here. The table spots were, were good, and it was a shame that they didn't break, because, uh, ow, uh, the one table spot that uh, Trey took, like, to the legs of the table, um, that did not look fun to take. Um, I thought the, you know, it was kind of goofy with uh, with Sammy like trapping uh, Trey under the steps and like not thinking that Trey could just you know crawl under the uh, ring and go out a different side. But I mean the visual of Trey coming up and uh, like getting on the apron and doing the running cutter through the table, um, it looked pretty good. So I thought it was solid enough, not like match of the year or anything, but uh, it was it was a good enough match. Yeah. Um, Speaking of refs not knowing what the hell they were supposed to be doing, uh, I do need to point out that in the triple threat at the beginning of the show, um, Brian Hebner, I believe, was the ref for it. um, And he uh, uh, took away Ace Austin's card uh, during a no-DQ match. um, 
as well as apparently commentary saying that the ref the match should have been thrown out uh, because of uh, Madman Fulton pulling TJP off of uh, either Josh Alexander or Ace Austin uh, near the end of the match. Um, which again, no, it's a no DQ match, so anything goes. But yeah, um, after this was probably one of the more eye opening matches or I catching matches, I guess, for people trying to watch this show. It was uh, Finn Juice, tag team from New Japan, uh, David Finlay, and uh, Juice Robinson. I always call him David Finlay, but Matt Stryker always kept on saying Lay, Finlay, Finlay, um, which I, I, I don't hear normally. Like nobody, I don't remember anybody calling Fit Finlay, Fit Finlay. Uh, and I don't, I've never heard Kevin Kelly call David Finley, fin, uh, David Finlay. Uh, but yes, uh, they are the current Impact Tag Champs uh, versus the Good Brothers, who are probably one of the most well known tag, uh, tag teams in the world today. Um, I think every, uh, there's probably a lot of people who are expecting the Good Brothers to just get their titles back. Uh, Finn Juice had their little run in Japan. Got some eyes on the product, brought some eyes to this, uh, and then Good Brothers can take their titles back. That was not the case. Um, this was, I thought this was a little bit better than their their first match up. Um, these guys have good chemistry, um, and it does show. Uh, again, the whole story behind this match matchup is that uh, Finn Juice were kind of the uh, the young boys, the young lions. Uh, to the Good Brothers when the Good Brothers were having their runs in Japan, um, and now the Finn Juice want to show the like what they've learned and that they can hang with the big guys. The as they've called themselves uh, called the Good Brothers themselves, uh, the one of the best tag teams in the history of wrestling, um, and I, they've shown it twice now. Uh, the whole storyline for this match was that the Good Brothers took uh, Finn Juice uh, kind of lightly the first time that they weren't ready. They were too cocky, uh, and they just lost because of that. Uh, this time, the Good Brothers kept on talking about in promos that they were ready, that they've been aw awakened, they, they are ready to get their titles back. Uh, and then they come out and... Fucking Doc Gallows is dressed up like a fucking goofball, uh, not looking like he's taking this seriously at all, with his jacket that says dangly down the side of it. Uh, and oh, his... stop, stop it. He looked phenomenal. <laughs> it's a good look, but it doesn't make you, me think, man, this guy's taking it seriously. I disagree. Um, so... Uh, it also doesn't. <laughs> the other thing is that, like, the look would look better if Carl Anderson was doing this, like his goofy look from AEW the last few weeks. Uh, but he didn't. He just looked like normal Carl Anderson that was taking it seriously. So the, that that took it a little off. But once they got in the ring, once the match started, uh, it was all seriousness, no games. Um, I think again, the, for anybody who watched. Doc Gallows, uh, for the first half of their run so far in Impact, uh, you'd probably say, man, this doesn't look like the same Doc Gallows. This looks like Doc Gallows who actually cares about what he's doing. Uh, he looked really good in this match. Um, Carl Anderson, when he wants to go, is one of the better workers in the entire company of Impact, probably. Um, he, he's a very, very, very good re worker. Um, and Juice and Finley, I think, don't get enough credit for how good they are. Um, I certainly haven't given Finley enough credit for how good he is. Uh, and they are a really good tag team, and they, they do have really good chemistry with each other, but they had really good chemistry with Good Brothers. Uh, and for a team that, to be fair, they, like, I didn't know that they've if they've wrestled each other on TV before, other than their first matchup uh, being a few months ago. Um, they, these guys look like they've worked together for years, which is great. Um, Finn Juice kind of steal uh, the win here with a quick roll up near the end here after uh, 
the Good Brothers tried to get a magic killer in. Uh, and yeah, Finn Juice retains. And now the question is, are they staying in Impact for a bit, or are they going back to Japan? Commentary indicated that they are going back to Japan with the belts again, um, but who knows? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was teased that, uh, but you know, over in New Japan, that like uh, Naito might want to go after it. That'd be kind of wild if they managed to pull that off. I don't really see that happening, but you never know. Uh, crazier things have happened, I guess. Um, I have I never saw the original Good Brothers Finn Juice match. Uh, did I? I don't think I did. No, I don't know if you I don't, did. I, I don't remember it. So, um, yeah, I would say this is good. Uh, solid tag match. Both teams looked really good. Um, don't really think I have anything else to add. It was good. Not, not, I would say good, not great. That's fair. Um... Yeah, there's definitely been better tag matches, but this is one of those stronger Good Brothers matches in a while. Um, after this, we had our knockouts ta- or knockouts championship match between Tennille Dashwood with Caleb with a K in her corner versus Deanna Parazzo, who was advertised that it was just going to be her, but she did bring out Susan and Kimberly, who. Little did anybody know, because they didn't advertise that there was going to be a pre-show to this show. There was a pre-show, and it was uh, there was a pre-show match between uh, Rosemary and Havoc versus Susan and Kimberly. What a way to give Kimberly a return, being on an unannounced pre-show match. Um, so, I thought this was going to be a really big contender for Match of the Night. Uh, coming up to it just because Deanna is fantastic. Tennille, when she wants to, is one of the better women's wrestlers out there. Um, I felt like these two did not click very well. Um, There were a few botches early on, and I felt like towards the end of the match, it kind of just got, like, I don't know, it's just like something just didn't click for me in this match. Um, I don't know if you felt the same way. Um, I was expecting more from this just because of the two women involved. I don't think it ever really reached that level. I also think it was kind of hampered by the constant interference from either Caleb, Susan, or Kimberly. Um, especially towards the end of the match. Um, which, you know, not the not the biggest fan of. Uh, I, I think this would have been a much stronger match had it actually just been Deanna versus uh, Tennille. Um, and I also think the wrong person won. I still think... Uh, that Tennille should have won here, um, personally speaking. Um, so I'm a bit upset by that. I didn't think the match was like offensively bad or anything, but it wasn't anything special. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying it's offensively bad. Uh, I, again, go, if you look at the two women on here, you'd think this would be a top-tier women's match for Impact of late, um, especially off of how good Deanna versus Jazz was at Hardcore Justice. Um, and, yeah, what Pat said, the the interference towards the end definitely did get really annoying, really took away from this match um, towards the end. Um, I do not think that Tennille is out of the title picture. I think this is where you can kind of turn Tennille face because she is still technically a heel. Um I think that the ending of this match definitely shows her kind of drifting towards a face role with her, like, basically trying to get rid of Susan and Kimber um, and then getting beaten down by all three after the match ended. Um, So I think we are going to get another matchup between them, and I think... It, if we do, that is where you see Tennille take the title off of Deanna. Um, which I, I would say, as long as the match is strong, uh, the second match, um, it will end Deanna's second reign with the title uh, in a strong fashion. Compare, in le- like the, If she lost here, that would kind of be like it ended with a whimper um, based off of how the match ended up going. Um so, yeah, hopefully we get, like, a matchup between the two of them where there isn't... I don't, uh, I don't know, man. We have to talk about who returned here, and uh, I, I think that's very clearly who's going after this belt. 
Yeah, uh, so after the match to make the save, um, Taylor Wilde's, like, commercial vignette thing starts playing. We should also mention that throughout oh, this no. match... Oh, no, 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 just wait, throughout the match... Throughout the match, the, the mics on the ground oh, were yeah. picking up stuff, like, the, like uh, Kimber and Susan yelling and talking very loudly... Um, for no apparent reason, but also kind of echoey. And so Taylor Wilde's music starts, or Taylor Wilde comes out, her music starts playing, and her music starts kind of echoing as well, but it's really, like, the voice for it is super high-pitched. And I really hope that isn't what they're going to go with. Like, I hope it's that, like, that was just an audio issue, because... The lo- her whole like, I've got a lot. I've got a lot of issues with Taylor Wilde's gimmick, from being, like, all the ad like the vignettes and stuff being a punk rock bathroom with like misfits posters and uh, like a CBGB's '80s vibe, um, like an underground vibe. To her coming out in the goddamn red, white, and blue Lacey Evans esque gear. Yeah, I was gear. gonna say she looked like she was doing a Lacey Evans cosplay. Um, that that isn't what like punk rock or any of that look like. That's not the look I thought it, anything was gonna be. Um, so yeah, um, this was. This was an interesting end of the match. Yeah, I guess we're getting Taylor Wilde versus Deanna. Taylor can take the title off of Deanna or Tennille. I don't know what happens. Um, but yeah, this was some. That theme was something. Um, as the fight Absolutely TV. Absolutely dreadful. Dreadful is how I would describe that theme song. That sounded like pure fucking insanity. It was. I need I need like a studio release of that song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the the if you watch on Fight TV, you can get like comments and stuff of people, and there were some really there were, there was nobody liking this this music. There were a few people asking like, is, has this song been released? Uh, a lot of people complaining about how it doesn't fit her, uh, how this isn't her original theme. Why didn't they just keep her original theme? Um, which, I mean makes sense um and yeah there's that's basically it um for that match uh then we got a rundown of pay-per-views and impact plus specials for the next few months uh so we've got a impact plus show uh next month uh it is under siege um then we have uh, against all odds in June, which they didn't advertise as an Impact Plus show, um, because for against all odds it says Impact Plus against all odds under on it for or under siege for uh, against all odds it just said Impact Wrestling presents uh, against all odds so that seems like that's going to be an actual pay per view um, so it seems like they're going back to their regular. Every few or every month is going to have an Impact Plus show, but we're also going to have a few more pay per views scattered about. Which okay, um, and then we got a preview or like a kind of a trailer for uh, Slammiversary, which uh, doesn't appear to have an actual date yet. Um, but we got a trailer, and it seems to indicate that they are going to be getting fans back, it seems, um, for that show, which makes total sense. What doesn't make sense <laughs> is who they showed on the trailer, Pat. Um, Do you want me to go through this? So I'll highlight the, I'll hi- highlight the people that we... So last year, if you remember, it was after the... WWE bulk releases and they kind of teased basically anybody who got released from WWE. Um, for this one, uh, it starts off with them like showing streets. Some people are saying it's de- uh, like the outskirts of New Orleans. 
Uh, some people are saying it's just Nashville, so it could be either one of them. Uh, they're both in the south. They're both basically all open, so makes sense uh, for allowing fans back in, um, which Impact shows definitely need. Um, and then they had people carrying signs in front of their faces saying, uh, our world changes again. And it flashed uh, Samoa Joe's face, uh, Mickey James, Laurel Van Ness, uh, formerly uh, Chelsea Green in WWE. Um, <laughs> the Mexican and either the Australian or New Zealand flag. I think it is the Australian flag okay. from what I've seen. Okay. Um, and then, Pat, do you want to carry the other people? Yeah, uh, so I saw people saying that it was El Samurai, but apparently it's actually Keiji Muto, um, which, oh. would, ma which would make more sense because he actually was in Impact. Um, okay. Because the, the, the running theme of this is that it, all of the people that they showed are people that have been in Impact. Okay. Um, the flags are the ones that could be seen as, like, hinting at Mexico, obviously, would be, like, Andrade, and Australia would be the Iconics. Um, I don't know who was released that was Canadian. Is Mojo Canadian? Uh, Chelsea is Canadian. Oh, yeah, but, well, Chelsea, Mojo, they show, um, let me look. I think Mojo's American. I have no idea. But if, if Yes, Mojo's he's Can American. Okay, so I have no idea who the Canada flag would be for, because Kalisto's not Canadian. Oh, that's, uh, that's somebody I forgot existed. Uh, um, so, yeah, he, yeah, I mean... Tucker? We, Tucker? Is Tucker Canadian? Oh, I hope. Tucker Knight. Uh, if you count uh, Oregon as Canada. No, I don't think so. So I have no idea what the Canada flag was for, but... Uh, so KG Muto, uh, I don't see KG Muto appearing on this show. Uh, hey, and man. the other ones you have are a young Okada, uh, because they used footage from, like, around his time in TNA, and the tag team that no longer exists, obviously, because they're in two different factions in New Japan, No Limit, made up of Tetsuya Naito and Yujiro Takahashi... Your boy uh, popped when I heard it, when I saw Yujiro's face. A young Yuge. I think we can rule out Okada and Yujiro for this show. No. Um, you can I, never was, you can never count out Yuge. Th they just wouldn't make sense. Like Naito at least has like shown some interest in the Impact Tag Titles, which is why I could say like, oh, maybe they're somehow going to get Naito here. Which right. Is, I have no idea what else Naito's doing. Right, and that's how he gets it. He really is like focused on it, on the Impact Tag Titles. And Yujiro gets kicked out of Bullet Club, and he oh. looks up and he looks across, and Naito gives him his hand. I don't think so, pal. I'm just gonna cut, I'm just gonna cut you off here. Uh, I I just think it's kind of weird that you're gonna have if they if they were to get like Naito, uh, it'd probably be like the team of like Naito and Sonata, because um, Sonata obviously also has ties to Impact. Um, but that it would be those two challenging Finju, so it'd be two New Japan teams fighting for the Impact Tag Titles. Um, on an impact show so um interesting stuff out of all these people who do you think you could see actually showing up for this um so i can see samoa joe i can see mickey james i can see chelsea green that is it um, um i don't I see could... i don't see andrade I guess you could. See, I could see the iconics, and the iconics could be like the next, like a surprise challengers for the tag straps, which is a team that definitely needs to come back because everybody. That that was the biggest mistake WWE did last year was break up the iconics. Uh, yeah, that's probably fair. Um, trying to really. Uh think i so i could see samoa joe showing up i don't think samoa joe is going to sign with impact but i could see similar no. to how he briefly appeared in ring of honor before going to nxt i could see him briefly appearing in impact for a little bit before signing somewhere um i do think the iconics will end up um it may be at that show i still part of me i really don't know where they're gonna go i don't think i think wherever they go they're gonna go together because i think they want to be together and i think they also know that they're better together yes um so i'll be interested to see if they end up in impact or AEW. both of them could use them um mickey james is kind of a wild card i don't know where she wants to go if she wants to go to nwa to be with her husband if she wants to go to impact to you know uh go where she was treated great already or AEW to be like a veteran um Oh man, 
I really, I really don't know. I don't know who they're going to get for this. I hope they deliver on something good and shocking or surprising or just cool all around. Um, because I'd love nothing more than for Impact to have, like, back-to-back -back really strong big pay-per-views with this and uh, that. Yeah. Um, I mean, all I feel like all their pay-per-views have delivered. Like, uh, hard to I kill. I mean, not, not, not like the... Uh, yeah, I would say the, the pay-per-views we watched have the, whatchamacallit... The Impact Plus um, shows have not. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, they're, they definitely feel like a just way too long Impact show um, compared to the pay-per-views that definitely seem to get treated seriously. It's just the production is atrocious at points. Um, other production issues before we go on to the main event. Uh, during Brian Myers and Matt Cardona... <laughs> um, as they rolled out, or went out of the ring, uh, the lights just got goddamn bright as hell for no apparent reason. <laughs> um, we had the echoey stuff during the women's match. Uh, there was a few echoey points during um, the triple threat at the beginning of the match where you could just hear Madman Fulton and somebody else who wasn't at ringside, so I'm assuming it was like a producer uh, yelling because... Uh, like, they'd show Madman Fulton talking or, like, yelling stuff, and, like, you clearly hear a conversation going. Um, and just the normal just impacts co awful commentary. Um, D'Lo Brown and Matt Stryker have gotten so old so quickly. I they're, When they first showed up, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll give them a shot, and they they... They were not very bad. They were they were pretty good. Matt Stryker can call a match good. But it feels like either he was told to stop calling matches properly or he just was like, okay, now I've got this job secure. Let me just talk about dick all. Um, because this man feels like every five seconds he needs to ask D'Lo Brown a question about something that is not going to help me enjoy this match. Um, then we got to the main event and the commentary, uh, quality <laughs> rose a billion times by one individual. Uh, would you agree with that, Pat? A hundred percent. I could not understate how important Mara Ranallo was to this match in the main event. Yeah. So again, for those who weren't aware, Mara Ranallo was announced that he was going to call this match. Matt Stryker this week claimed that Mara Ranallo, when he heard about this match, he called Scott to more uh, to request that he could uh, be in this match, which if that actually happened, cool. I highly doubt it. Um, and then also claimed that he has a working relationship with Impact Wrestling for over 20 years, which doesn't make sense because Re Impact Wrestling hasn't existed for over 20, or has existed for, I think, since 2002 so 19 years so yeah um and he's never worked in impact or tna so um weird uh mar ranallo at multiple points during this match refused to answer questions by that matt striker just would randomly throw out like mar is calling the match like he normally does a play-by-play -play announcer through and through that i thoroughly enjoy you can call, find, like, his random quotes annoying and his random, like, pop culture references annoying, but the man is top-notch when it comes to actually calling a match. Matt Stryker would, like, they, he'd throw it to Matt Stryker to, like, talk about some of the wrestling moves, and Matt Stryker would just be like, so, Maro, how do you think Rich Swan can counter this move uh, and how do you feel about his striking ability compared to Kenny Omega? And Mar Ranallo would just not say anything except go right into what was actually happening, which I like because I don't care about who I think is a better striker and how I can counter this striker's ability. Uh, I don't care about uh, having to hear e D'Lo and Matt Stryker answer questions over and over again. It, it's just... That's not what I care about about wrestling. I'd like to know about the moves. I'd like the moves to be called correctly. I would like the moves to be emphasized if it's a big move. Um, and Mara Ranallo does that for me. And if Impact could get Mara Ranallo 
on commentary. I wouldn't even care if we got zero other commentary people other than Mauro Ranallo. I would be 100% okay with it because he's fucking amazing. Even if they just managed to get him for pay-per-views, I think that would be a huge improvement. Yeah, kind of like how Don Callis is, was only doing Impact pay-per-views uh, yeah, for exactly. a bit. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, they just know how to call a match better. Um, yeah. Um, weird flex for AEW here where they just brought Tony Schiavone and he <laughs> was not a commentator. He just sat in the crowd of three people being Jerry Lynn, Tony Khan, and <laughs> Tony Schiavone. Well, to be fair, I mean, he's been featured on Impact with Tony in, like, the ads, so it made sense, technically. Yeah. Um, Jerry Lynn, the most devilish heel in all of Impact um, for him helping Matt Hardy in Private Party get a title shot. Um, and that feels like an like a year ago at this point that that, that angle happened. Um, so, title versus title... Uh, Kenny Omega comes out, uh, first off, Don Callis comes out, uh, and then Kenny comes out with, uh, the Good Brothers, um, who have changed, um, they're not wearing their ring gear, we've got, um, and Gallows isn't wearing his dangly or his goofy jacket, he's just wearing a sweatshirt that is unzipped all the way, um, and then Rich Swan comes out with Eddie Edwards and Willie Mack by his side. Um, I thought that there would be shenanigans in this match. There were not. Um, Pat, you thought that the Young Bucks were going to come out to help get the win. I they did wrong. not appear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you give me a bonus point for getting that correct? I did. All right. I just want to make sure that you weren't screwing me out of a point here. Um, so that point could have been... Could have been big. Well, not really, because I still would have won the tiebreaker. Um, so this was a uh, this was a really good match. Uh, there were a few moments of botches. Uh, Rich Swan brought Kenny up to the top rope and the, or was trying to bring Kenny up to the top rope at one point, uh, and his knee buck or leg buckled, and he just dropped Kenny from the top, <laughs> face first into the mat. Um, and then later on, they were going for another top rope spot, and I guess it was supposed to be like a Hurricane Rana by Rich Swan, uh, but Rich completely missed, and Kenny just fucking fell back at his head first right onto the mat. Um, so those looked painful, um, but other than that, they looked really good together. Um, considering that Stryker and... Um, D'Lo this week on commentary for regular impact um, we're hyping up Rich Swan to be one of the best strikers in the world and one of the hardest hitters in the world uh, his hits and slaps and stuff sounded not, n did not sound painful uh, compared to the chops and slaps that Kenny was giving throughout this match. Uh, Kenny looked like he was just trying to beat the crap out of Rich Swan, and Rich Swan just like his I, like he was very energetic throughout the match, but like he, 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 you can tell that he's nowhere on the level of Kenny Omega when it comes to striking. Um, this was at points very hard to watch uh, because of how brutal uh, some of the uh, the V triggers were that <laughs> Rich Swan was eating, uh, including one right in front of Eddie and Willie Mac, where uh, he looked dead. Uh, and was just drooling all over, like, dro big globs of drool were just coming out of his mouth. Um, the fact that he he stayed in this for as long as he did um, definitely shows that he is this resilient baby face, but he, he was no match for Kenny Omega, uh, and Kenny stands tall after a one-winged angel, um, and... This was a really strong ending of the sh show. Um, I was expecting shenanigans, as I said. There weren't any. Um, I think the only real shenanigan was Kenny... Uh, er, Kenny pushed uh, Brian Hebner into the way uh, of Rich Swan's uh, cut, uh, ha handspring cutter. Um 
and Aubrey Edwards came in to try to do, like, just prevent any shenanigans from happening. She took the chair out of Kenny's hands. Uh, Kenny was like, hey, you're part of AEW. I'm AEW. You want AEW to win. And she was like, not like this. Um, Callis pulled uh, Hebner, I believe, once. Um, but other than that, there, there was no, like, the Good Brothers didn't get involved. Eddie Edwards and uh, Willie Mack stayed in their corner. They never attacked the Good Brothers. Um, it, it was less uh, crazy uh, and convoluted than I thought it was going to be, and I think that you thought it was going to be. Yeah, uh, you're not wrong at all. I also expected this to kind of end in some type of shenanigans here, and I was pretty shocked. I wasn't shocked at the finish, but I was shocked that we got just a, a clean pin here. There was no, there was no cheating. There was attempted cheating, but no actual cheating here. Um, so good on Impact for that. They promised a decisive winner, and they gave you as decisive as it gets with Kenny Omega pinning Swan clean. I thought the match was a really very like a very strong main event, probably one of the better impact main events for their pay per views that we've seen over the last year. Yeah. Um I thought Kenny Omega performed like as you would expect from Kenny Omega, and I thought Swan for the most part held his own aside from the couple botches that we saw. Um but yeah, I thought this was a, a, a pretty killer main event and uh, this is an exciting now now it's gonna be interesting to see how Impact and AEW handle this relationship now that Kenny has the world title of Impact. Um, I wouldn't be shocked. I would hope, at the very least, um, obviously AEW's priorities right now are getting Blood and Guts done in, uh, next week, um, and following that, um, doing, whatchamacallit, uh, Double or Nothing. I would hope, if not before, then after, like, immediately after on, like, the, the Fallout show of Double or Nothing is when you have somebody from Impact show up to go after Omega. Um... So I'll be intrigued to see how they handle this situation with him holding the Impact World title. <coughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, you've got to make sure that uh, they're... Um, like, if, if he ha- holds this title and Impact is, like, not buying ads or anything, like, it's also on AEW to at least promote that this man is, a, is, your world, is the Impact World Champion as well. Um, like, it just feels like, um, like, uh, when, uh, Tony Khan this week went on, busted open and said, oh, well, I've been buying ads on Impact, uh, and giving Impact money for this, um, and they just haven't, so that's why we haven't been promoting it, we're not gonna give free ads away. Sure, but at the same time, like, you should at least promote that your champion is going to impact. Like, he's still your wrestler. Um, and it would explain a little bit more why Don Callis, the Impact EVP, is showing up weekly. Um, like, I don't think just having Don Callis and saying the Impact EVP is here uh, is enough to be like, okay, well, Kenny Omega is in a storyline going for the Impact World Championship. Um I think that it, I think I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I think that they need to work something out if these working relationships are going to exist. I think that the AAA stuff is still boggles my mind that Kenny Omega, it, like that AAA, is like so protective of their stuff that they don't want like contracted wrestlers of AAA to use their triple a names if they're on a different promotion like impact or uh aw uh and that they won't let their belt be seen that their world champion is holding except on special events which that just seems counterintuitive um but i guess it is what it is um and i guess we'll see what happens next for the belt collector kenny omega uh, and what goes next. Um, who do you think is next in line for a title shot, Pat? Like, within Impact? Yeah. Because I don't think anybody in AEW is going to challenge for the Impact title. Um, 
Shit, I don't know. Um, I did say on our predictions podcast, I thought that having Trey beat Sammy would make Trey like a solid filler uh, challenger for Omega. Um, so like at against all odds or whatever, they could do Trey versus Kenny. Yeah, um, I could see Trey going for it. I could see. Um... A tip, Chris Bay did put out a tweet saying that he uh, he could be the person to take it off Kenny. So Chris Bay's a potential. See, I don't think Bay is somebody that's going for it. I I think Bay's just. I think Bay could be a long term person to take it off. I don't think you'd throw him out in that this early. Um, because he is a heel currently, um, and I don't think you're going to do heel versus heel like that. I think you can, you can easily turn Chris Bay face because a lot of people really like Chris Bay. Um, I was going to, I was going to say you could throw Cardona in there if Cardona didn't get injured tonight. Um, I think you can always throw in Eddie Edwards for a short term feud because it's Eddie Edwards. Um... You'd throw James Storm in there. That would be an interesting match. Um, I'd also wouldn't be opposed to Chris Saban, but I don't think he's positioned well enough. Um, so I, I, my guess would be either Trey or Eddie, just because Eddie is the face and the heart and soul of Impact. Uh, and Trey Miguel came up with a big singles win tonight. So th- those would be my guesses. Um, what would be wild would be if the person to take off the title isn't Moose. It is a returning Samoa Joe to get the to fight for Impact and get Impact's title back. That would be a wild thing to happen. I that that would get a lot of people interested. If long term the story is Samoa Joe versus Kenny Omega. Uh, that would be something. Um, I don't, I don't think anybody would complain. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think anybody would complain about Samoa Joe in a world title picture because I think that's what everybody wanted in WWE was Samoa Joe to win the world title. Um, NXT title, yes, he, he won it, I think, twice, right? Um, but he, he never got that world title. He got, I think, what, one U.S. title run? <laughs> um, and yeah. Uh, it just feels like he deserves. He he should have gotten so much more there. Um, so if he is healthy enough, if he could go, uh, I, he, him versus Kenny Omega would be a really good worked match because Samoa Joe is phenomenal in ring and on the mic. Him, yeah, him, I I don't. Those disagree. promos would be. That's 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 fair. <laughs> yeah. Um, so overall, Pat, how how would you grade this show? I'd give it a thumbs up. I thoroughly enjoyed the main event. I thought the X Division three way was really solid. Um, thought the tag match between the Good Brothers and Finjuice was pretty good. Thought Tennille and Diana underdelivered mainly due to the interference with the booking. Um, and I thought Trey and Sammy was also pretty solid. I agree. I would go with thumbs up as well. What was your favorite match of the night? Would it be the uh, main, main event? Yeah, the main event, one hundred percent. Yeah, the same. Uh, other than the main event, what would be your second? Uh, probably the X Division Triple Threat. All right. Yeah, uh, I would probably go with that as well. Uh, it was either that or um, the last man standing match. Um, so yeah, uh, Pat will be back with a, another episode of the Dynamic Dynamite review on when. Day is Joey joining you for that this week? Uh, he did say he plans on it, so we'll see. All right, and then myself and Angela should be back on Thursday for our Impact Power Hour, uh, and yeah, yeah, you'll also get uh, most likely Angela's uh, thoughts about the show as well. Uh, so, good night. Uh, thank you guys for listening. We'll talk to you the next time. Bye. <laughs>